Zoom lady does not have to yell at us about the meeting being recorded. The meeting is being live streamed. Okay. A perfect time for this. All right, we are now live. What did I say? Hello, and welcome to issue 613 of Geek in the City Radio. I am your totally prepared and not at all uh, frustrated by technology host, Beanerita. And I am your other other host, Cable Hashtani. <laughs> oh, off to a rip roaring start already. Uh -huh. Yep, yep. Ah. Uh. Yep. Whether if either one of you are gone, I still do the pause and then do the end up your other other host. <laughs> that is good to know. Um, I don't know what I'll use that for, but I'm sure it's useful information for something diabolical. It always manages to throw Aaron. Uh, Aaron is out on assignment today. Um, every time because he'll do his intro and then look at me and then I don't say anything. I just kind of, <laughs> there's a beat. And then I go, and I'm your other other host. And he's like, right. He was waiting for, God damn it. <laughs> he doesn't realize I'm doing a bit every single time. To be fair, you're, you're not absent very often. I'm not. Uh, that's just, that just shows how dedicated I am to this show. Um, <laughs> it's actually funny that you should say I'm not that absent from the show often because right now I'm feeling like this is my first time back in like a month. Or like I've missed a month of shows. No, I know that that might be true, but not consecutive. But definitely, like recently, I've I've been out a lot, and uh, hence my feeling a little bit like discombobulated right now. I think. Hmm. Sorry, I was um, also distracted by the text box. If you want to take a look at that real quick, I just saw that. Oh no. Yeah. yeah. Also, uh, hi, Kevin. Hi, Bex. Yeah, hi, friends. Oh, gosh. I hope I hope you're, I mean, you must be doing okay. You wouldn't be sitting here listening to us blather on while you're, you know, typing the, away. There is a, a, a very important word in there, and that word is asymptomatic. Oh, oh, that is what he said, isn't it? Yep. Okay. Um, so it, it can be nerve wracking, right? Like if you, if you're asymptomatic, who knows how long you've been carrying it around for and who you might've passed it around to in that time. I don't know. I would get really worked up about it. So as someone who does not get sick often, um, when I do get sick, I have uh, mild symptoms and so knowing that COVID has an asymptomatic, like it can present asymptomatically, where it's like, you have COVID, you have no symptoms. Um, feeling like I fall into the category of like, oh, I could have been carrying asymptomatic COVID the entire pandemic. It freaks me out on a regular basis. Like mm. it's just sitting in the back of my head. Um, Like uh, yesterday, I went to go get my first COVID test throughout from the entire pandemic because you can't go get tested if you don't have any symptoms. So if I have, if I'm asymptomatic and I'm not in a position where I'm being told by my work or I'm not exposed, I don't have a reason to go use up those resources. So I've held off. Um, I had reason to. So I went and got tested. Test came back neg negative. So yay. Um, but it's a, I still want to get the, um, antibody test to see if I've ever carried it at any time. Mm. And I don't know how far back that will go either. Okay. Uh, can, can you, I didn't, I didn't know if it was possible to get an accurate antibody test after you'd already been vaccinated. That I don't know. Maybe I, can't. I definitely get curious sometimes especially because i came down really sick february of 2020 so like mm -hmm. almost almost a full month before you know shit hit the proverbial fan and 
you know, like as soon as I say it out loud, I'm like, it wasn't, you're fine. Just move on. But you know, but every now, every like, I don't know, four to six months, I'm like, Hmm, I wonder. And there's never, I don't, I, I feel like there's no real way of ever knowing. Uh, I think, um, uh, Kevin's description in the chat uh, gives us a pretty a better kind of um, gauge on what it feels like based on uh, descriptions of other people who have had it. So mm. that, that's that's the other reason I'm like, just don't stop, don't be silly because I do know people who've who've had it uh, and were not hospitalized, but mm -hmm. but yeah, it was it was rough. I, I think that uh, the if you had an adverse secondary reaction or an adverse reaction to the second vaccination shot, that is probably the uh, that's going to be your measure of what COVID would have been like for you if you had actually had it. Right. Um... Which mine was still, oh, I have a headache. Nope, I'm fine. Mm. No, my 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 skeleton wanted to kill me. Mm -hmm. I remember um. quite cl quite <laughs> clearly that all of all y'all were uh, kind of down for the count for a couple weeks. Yeah, it w for me it was like the day the day of was moderate. The day after was pretty intense. Second day was like back to moderate again. Mm -hmm. And then it's just, you know, then you're just recovering essentially. Um, mm -hmm. I'd rather, I'd rather have that than real COVID though. So, mm -hmm. so anyway, uh, what did you do this weekend? Speaking, speaking of COVID Petri dishes, um, I uh, worked Rose City Comic Con for Bridge City or not for Bridge City for um, Guardian Games. Um, so I was, uh, this is the first time Guardian Games has tabled at uh, Rose City Comic Con, largely because of the old contract that Rainy Day Games used to have with them, um, which is now, you know, now that we are owned by the same company, <laughs> oh, it is right. null and void. <laughs> so I was thinking it had more to do with the... Um the changeover of ownership with Rose City Comic Con itself, I completely spaced on the fact that you guys are now owned mm -hmm. by the same umbrella, so to speak. Yep. Uh, Rainy Day Games had a, um, under its previous ownership, uh, had a five-year exclusive contract for uh, to be the only game store and game provider at uh, Rose City Comic Con for so that just meant uh, guardian under its former ownership just went well that's a convention we won't pay attention to it and never worried about it um however this year it's like oh well that means the parent company that owns both of our stores is now the uh doesn't have the exclusive contract but it was asked to be the sponsor or be a sponsor. So it's like, oh yeah, we'll sponsor you and both of our stores will have one booth, which is great. Um, Rainy Day staff uh, provided, uh, they basically worked all of the demo tables that were at the four corners of our booth. And then Guardian staff worked sales mostly. I, I just sat there and minded the register and made sure nothing caught fire. That's so. a big, 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 issue of concern at many conventions i mean it kind of is <laughs> um if the, the on the plus side for the convention um i'm happy that for the most part um all of the vendors and all of the artists and everyone who was there was complying with masks mask ordinances like you you had the odd person uh, who still thinks that they have to move it down their face so they can talk to people and then put it back up when that's precisely when you're not supposed to be doing that. Um, because a lot of these folks are coming in not, not just from out of town, but out of state. Mm -hmm. And they're 
you know, whatever their state is, their state mandates are completely different. Um, like we did, like I ended up buying some, uh, hi, um, what's the word, bootleg, uh, bootleg uh, minifigs uh, from a vendor that was up from Texas. And they were all masked and did not like to them it was, oh no, it's no thing. We're wearing our mask. We've got our vaccine cards. It's like, cool. And you're from the state that's actively trying to kill you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, regardless of where, what, what phase or risk level your, you know, your home state is at right now, at this point, everyone should know the correct way to wear a mask, whether you want to do it or not. This is true. You do know that they did away with the risk levels, right? Um, what do you mean? The CDC stopped issuing risk levels. Like they still exist, but they're not talking about them and they're not declaring. Um, they're basically, it, it's so that no one has to enforce any guidelines about how many people can be in a building at any one time. Mm. So that the economy can, so that businesses can stay open so that conventions can run so that concerts can go on gotcha the cdc is not using those anymore no as, uh, be, as a federal mandate like that gotcha which is stupid and i did the, i wasn't really aware or i hadn't actually been thinking about that i just meant whatever your governor calls mm -hmm. however they are structuring their you know their COVID restrictions or guidelines. Because here in Oregon, they call them phases, right? The, that's what I'm saying. So, Those okay. don't exist anymore. Because the CDC is no longer declaring what it should be. Right, because, they, because when you put that into place, then businesses have to close or limit occupancy. They've taken that tool away so that no one has to restrict anything. Super. Even though that's exactly what we should still be doing. Well, we should all we should also still be paying people to stay home, but you know, I'm. So here's the thing: uh, I enjoyed myself at Rose City. I got to see some people I haven't seen in a while. I worked the booth mostly, but I still like tried to spend up to an hour a day walking the floor and getting to see some people. That building is four blocks long and two blocks wide. It's huge. And the one thing that the convention center should be used for right now is housing the homeless and getting every single one of them vaccinated and medical care. And for the city uh, and state not to do that is fucking criminal. There shouldn't be any conventions. Rose City shouldn't have happened. Like I said, I enjoyed myself. It was a great time. A lot of people needed that. Like you could see it in their eye. That, that was one of the great things about it is it wasn't just, oh, it's great to see you. It's, hey, it's great to see you. You live in a completely different state. But now we get to face-to-face -face talk about the fact that we do very much agree on where we should be and what we should be doing for our local communities, our cities, our states, um, and larger. And to get that affirmation in person it feels so much stronger than just getting it through the internet. Right. So I do understand that component of what this what good this did um for people being whether people track that that that's what was going on or not mileage may vary but i i really do think that that is one of the great things that came about from this comic book convention um but that being said none of this should be occurring we like there are i could I think we've got like six tents on the street below our apartment 
right now. Only? It, well, Everett is a heavier trafficked street than, mm -hmm. say, Davis, which has more of an encampment uh, between Broadway and Sixth. The point being is you could put all of them under one roof with ventilation, get them the services they need, and get them back into actual housing. And then there isn't a homeless crisis. But meh. That, that means we also have to get Ted Wheeler out of office first. So That would be a good start. That would definitely yep. be a good start. Yep. If you're in California, do not recall your governor. If you're in Portland, please recall your mail mayor. Mm. <laughs> uh, Total Recall PDX has until I think Thanksgiving weekend oh, good. to to get the get the necessary signatures. So. And they are currently hiring petitioners. Hmm. I'll write that down. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. If uh, you want to get paid to get Ted Wheeler out of office. <laughs> now's your chance um mostly i just want to get paid so for listeners who don't follow me on social media uh or know me personally uh i lost my job last week which is why i wasn't here i was just sort of out of wind yes in my yeah wind sales completely divorced from each other and i did not have the the resources you know in, within myself to to be on mic um I mean, objectively, it's fine. We'll be fine. Everything is fine. But now I have to like go through this whole like existential dread that is finding a job again, um, and and then the you know the push, uh, you know to to provide income for my household. Mm -hmm. Like I have to feel like I'm contributing financially, or I'm not contributing. And that's like a whole. That's a whole bundle of feelings and thoughts that I have that probably we don't want to get into right now. I mean, we'll talk pop culture. And if we have extra time, <laughs> maybe this becomes a therapy session. Maybe we do therapy with everybody. I mean, we, we have some good, we've got a good group here. Like, I'm, I'm sure they would love to chime in. I'm just like equally daunted by the idea of like unburdening myself emotionally to others as I am uh, daunted by the idea of allowing others to emotionally unburden themselves onto me. Mm -hmm. Not because I have a problem with people sharing with me, but because I then I don't know what to do with that. I'm like, okay, you've given me all of these things from inside of you and I don't know what to do with it now because I'm, you know, but I'm, I'm drawn to like solve problems and that's not the point of that no you don't you don't have to do anything with that anytime and, and that's anyone, weird yeah <laughs> that's weird and i don't like it it's not weird it's what you've been trained to do yeah which means you are typically surrounded by people who create problems without knowing how to solve them and then you fix it for them but you don't have to, Denise. Anyway. Anyway, we watched we watched stuff. We we have watched so many things just just to tell you all about them. Did We're, just to just to give you fair a fair shake? Uh, both Aaron and I spoiler free talked about um, stuff Shang -Chi. around Shang Chi. Yeah, we talked about Shang Chi, but mostly talked around it in circles so that we. We couldn't uh, in rings, you could say. Yeah, that's actually the pun that I made at the top of the show, and, <laughs> and Aaron, Aaron just went. He got this look on his face and was like, "Like, are you mad at me because I made the pun, or are you mad at me because you didn't think of it first? He's like, "Yes, both." <laughs> yep. Mm. Uh, um, uh, what does it say about the three of us that like we've all we all? I mean, I guess it's kind of low hanging fruit, but. But mm -hmm. we all went there. We all three of us officially have gone there separately uh, because we have very similar senses of humor. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so you you talked 
we right, talked you loosely about it. talked about shang chi um, would you like to provide our listeners with any um any of your feedback any oh. non-spoilery thoughts i hadn't prepared any notes i guess like the big takeaway for not takeaway but the the thing that like the my first thought that i said out loud after having seen it was it was a lot more mystical than i was led to expect and i don't mean that in a bad way i mean you know, le- the, and the legend of the 10 rings and you, you see some pretty magical ass shit happening in the trailers, but even, even what they gave me was, was not enough. I was not prepared for the mm-hmm. level of mysticism and, and I guess magical realism almost is what you could call it. Um, just this idea that, uh, and see, and now I don't want to like say it in a way that's too revealing. Yeah, you just like it's okay not, not to say like this is a. Uh, it was number one at the box office for its second week, by the way. Yes. Um, and Bex has tickets. She's just said that she, so she hasn't made it to the movie yet, but she does have tickets. So, um, I think that if you are a, if you are familiar with the Ten Rings from the comics you were aware that there is a mystical element to them already Um, sure but as i pointed out to aaron last week i rewatched the trailer the first trailer that came out um after we all went and saw the movie and i discovered that the trailer consists that 85 percent of the trailer consists of the first 30 minutes of the movie which means the trailer tells you nothing Yes, I I noticed also that there were some like key elements from the trailer that came much earlier than I was expecting once we were watching the movie. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, I guess that's a that's a good way of putting it. I the what I formulated or I what I've come to now what I've reached in order to describe what I'm thinking is like if if you're on the fence about this movie because you think it's just going to be an action you know like another superhero movie. It's not. There's more to it than that. And if, you know, if just action isn't your bag, then I still encourage you to go see this movie. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that'll do. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, I did, uh, one of our neighbors at Rose City Comic Con was the uh, Felucia Academy, which is a uh, lightsaber dueling group. And one of our uh, longtime listeners, like he listens, he's been listening to the show since Film Fever Radio. Uh, Peter came over and introduced himself when we were chatting. He's one of the Jedi of the group. Um, and he also bought, uh, was asking me, he's like, I still haven't seen Shang-Chi, but I'm like, it's like, so I haven't listened to the episode. I'm like, we really don't spoil anything. We just basically go, oh my God, go see the movie. <laughs> he's like, okay, all right. Um, I did have one Shang-Chi cosplayer all during the weekend, which was cool. So like I I nearly screamed at him. <laughs> he was just casually walking at the booth and I just went, oh my God, Shang-Chi. <laughs> He's like, uh, it's like, I have to take a picture. I have to take a picture. He's like, oh, okay. So super. You'll have to send me that. I'll write this again. Um but I have the technology. I can do it right <laughs> now. Um, any other thoughts on Shang-Chi that you wanted to cover today? Um, I don't think so. Um, I don't know that I know what the uh, Disney Plus release date is. I couldn't tell you. I... I bet the internet. So bad. I'm so bad at keeping track of those things. I um I put I put things on my calendar now. I have like reminders, you know, like not like not like an alarm, but just like a a daily pop up uh, on my calendar for um when you show when new episodes of shows air, because that's the only way I'm going to remember all of them. There's there's quite a few good things out right now, such as you know lower decks and what we do in the shadows and everything's on a different night. So I just have to like basically set an alarm for for when new things are out that way. 
when it, as a reminder, just kind of lingers there until you check it off like a task. Mm. That way, if I don't get to see something the same day, I won't forget about it for, you know, who knows how many weeks after that. And I also, like I set one up because, um, so Why the Last Man premiered this week. Oh, right. Exactly. So it's on Hulu for FX or FX mm -hmm. for Hulu, however you call it. You can stream it on Hulu is the point. And for a show that's been in the works for like 10 years, it had a really, really quiet like lead up and release. The only time I've seen ads for it is on TikTok, I think. I don't even recall seeing ads for it on Hulu. Then again, I pay to not see ads. Um, I was actually surprised when I fired up my Hulu app on Monday night and it actually, you know how there's usually a header for a streaming app that says like, check out this new movie or this, you know, this is a show that we're really pumped about. Um, and it's kind of different every time. I was super, super surprised to see why the last man as their header card when the, when the app fired up, because I just feel like they're, I don't know, they might not hiding it, but they're not. They're not pumped about it. I feel like you should be pumped about it. It's Brian K. Vaughn. Um, which nobody outside of comic books knows. <laughs> I guess, but I mean, The Walking Dead was a comic book and God, people won't shut, shut up about that. Um, when it was new, it was, you know, people were talking about it a lot. It was advertised heavily. Um, the entire Granted, Marvel Cinematic Universe is based on comic books that no one reads or talks about. So right? this, none of this surprises me. Um, anyway, I'm like, I, uh, I have seen, I guess I, I've seen news about uh, Why the Last Man. It's, it's a comic that I've never read. So mm. I'm out of the loop on this one. I actually reread it last month in anticipation of this show coming out. Mm -hmm. um, and I do have to say it's, it has some problematic elements. I mean, it is very specifically about gender and, you know, like what makes us different. Um, and because it's like almost 20 years old, maybe a full 20 years old, it's got some outdated terminology uh, for things like transgender individuals. Um, also, liberal, liberal use of the R word. Well, maybe not liberal, liberal, but any, I, you know, at this point it's like verboten and, and they're, they're very casual about it in, in the way that, you know, people used to be. I see you processing. I'm trying to figure out what word. The R word? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. Got it. Hmm. That's in the book, though? It's not that. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, the book. And I, I don't think they've used it in the show at all. They'd get canceled in a minute. Um, Rightly so. Uh, at any rate, I, I'm enjoying it. It's, uh, they've definitely made some different choices, but I, I read, you know, bef even beforehand that they have deliberately made some changes because it's, you know, because times are different because the perceptions are different. Um, and because we're now living in an actual pandemic. Yeah. So, well, I mean, again, this show has been in development for several years now so uh i, I mean I, they probably did make some more recent adjustments once they knew it was going to premiere in 2021 in development can mean multiple things um a lot of times it just means that this production company optioned it and actively has someone attached to it but isn't doing any work they just want to make sure that they hold on to the ip Mm -hmm. and then they renew that uh, when it needs to be renewed like if that show when was the show originally scheduled to be out was it if it was 
Do you know that I could that I couldn't tell you. Um, uh, I only recently learned that, like, you know, it's been in the works for 10 years. I knew it had been some time, but I didn't. Um, if I if I knew the particulars at any time in the past, I've long since lost those details. Oh, let's see here. I don't know if I'm going to find it that quickly on Wikipedia, but hmm, that's fine. Yeah, there there is. You're not wrong. There is a lot to watch. Like we've now we've taken to waiting till Thursday to watch both What If and Lower Decks. So it's like, eh, hey, we're just watching this. Um, as opposed to spreading it out night after night after night. Oh yeah, there's a whole long uh, section in the Wikipedia about a canceled uh, film adaptation. Uh, anyway, I'm sure it's a whole rabbit hole. People can go down it if they That's choose. a long series. How would you have just done a movie? That's probably why it got canceled. Hmm. Um, I don't know. It's a long entry, so I'll. I don't know. I might check it out, but I'll probably forget. <laughs> Fair. Hmm. Uh, so anyway, if you're into Why the Last Man, or if you're interested but haven't read it before, the show is out now. They dropped three episodes. Check it out. I, I recommend it. Alrighty. <laughs> well, on to the shows that we are both watching. <laughs> yes. Um, Which one do you want to do first? I think we ought to start with uh, with what if. All what right. if? I I have to say, I so so appreciate um, Jeffrey Wright's um, delivery of those two little words, and I can't imagine how many times and how many deliveries he had to give of those two words. Till they went, yep, that's it. That's, that's it. That's, that's the title. The one. Or if you got he's it in one. He's got such a great voice and cadence, you know that. Mm-hmm. I, just to, I just want to believe, like the way he did it was was just the way it, it was. They're like, yep, that's great. You know, doesn't they went, look like anything to me. Uh, <laughs> have you caught back up on that show yet? Oh my god, no, I still haven't. Um, I keep forgetting. I don't, HBO does not remind me like it does about other nonsense. I I don't think HBO is going to remind you. Why would it's a it? They're not going to remind you, Denise. Why not? I just uh, I, I, I just explained all of the ways that I have to like keep track of the things that I'm already watching. Someone has to help me out with the stuff that I I'm, I like I, I already left behind before it gets further and further away. I I hmm hmm. <laughs> hmm. Welcome to my brain, Cable. Yep. <laughs> anyway, uh, last week's what if was what if zombies? <laughs> and uh, based on the very popular Mar- Marvel Zombies series, I, I believe. And yet, kind of still blended with what that would have looked like in the MCU. Um, I was amused that yet again, this was all Hank Pym's fault. I also noticed that. I was like, two in a row. Interesting. Not in a row. There was the, no, this was all Stephen Strange's fault in between there. Was it? Was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it it was... um, what if there were no Avengers and it was because Hank Pym became the yellow jacket and killed them all. And then it was, what if Dr. Strange was evil and then Marvel zombies. Oh, yeah. um, okay. You're right. Uh, I like the gag of um, Scott Lang in a jar. <laughs> um, the vision feeding parts of T'Challa to uh, Scarlet Witch is creepy don't understand why it needed to be another avenger like if you need to feed your zombie wife or partner i don't like i guess they're not married in this context or in this timeline um if you need to feed your zombie significant other 
Can't it just be anybody's body? Um, I think uh, the logic was that if he fed her someone with superpowers, that would sustain her longer than if he was feeding her normal humans. I'll I allow think. It. I don't know. There's there's a logic to that yeah. for sure. Overall, the entire planet was screwed because you know they collected all of the the remaining infinity stones to Wakanda, and then Thanos showed up and got them all and turned into a zombie himself. And then, what does zombie Thanos use the Infinity Gauntlet for? Does he just snap his fingers to create limitless brains for every, all of the zombies to eat? That's a very good question. Because if his whole, you know motivation is around you know resource depletion and population overload zombies would absolutely resolve that issue on their own because they eat the eat eat the resource eaters and then eventually there's until there's none left right and then what they, mm -hmm. they just eventually just like shrivel up and die they don't eat each other they certainly don't they they probably wouldn't resort to other earth resources true i don't know i don't know what other i don't know what other motivations he would have uh, especially now that he too is a zombie yep except for except for maybe to unzombify himself yeah see that gets into the whole you have to have a will in order to use the gauntlet to use all six infinity stones in conjunction Meh. yeah i'm not mm. sure uh i also find it like it was in it certainly raises the the uh, the terror stakes if all of the zombified avengers still have their powers but again, I get back into, wait, they're zombies. How do they know to do any of that? <laughs> right. And Sack is uh, mentioning in the chat uh, that, according to his recollection, the comic version of Marvel zombies was a la Return of the Living Dead, and mm. where you retain your memories and your personality, but you've got, you know, the hunger. That makes a lot more sense. I, I feel like I remember the Hulk in the comics turning early and just eating everyone because <laughs> he's the Hulk. Right, right. It's really hard to fight that. Mm -hmm. um, I did, while I enjoyed it, um, I did think it was probably the goofiest episode of What If to Date goofy and disturbing mm -hmm. um which we probably needed after an episode of dr strange destroying his entire universe yeah that was some that was some pretty like heavy pathos shit uh i mean mm -hmm. i loved it i'm here for it but it, it's smart i think like tonally to to mix it up and do something a little bit funnier afterwards um like you know um hope or not hope what's her name what's the daughter's name hope and what's the mom's name? Janet. I should know that by now. Um, anyway, yeah. so Hope, you know, Hope as the wasps does her embignation spell and, you know, like helps get them across the sea, uh, you know, this zombie horde and lets herself stay big, you know, as she's, as she's losing power, essentially. I'm like, well, that's not going to come back to bite everyone in the ass. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, and, and yes, it 100% it did. trying to i want to take a look at the at the voice actors for this episode that's a good one too uh steve coker is in the chat hi steve um mentioning uh it was pretty the ant-man stuff was pretty cool just the fact that like again because you retain knowledge of who you are and what you can do as an avenger ant-man that's isn't that how he got through no that's a different episode um isn't that how he was able to get through the hulk that was that was the other one 
No, that um, yeah, that was uh, Hank Pym killing all the Avengers. Yes, uh, but but that like going going tiny is how he was able to break through the Hulk's natural defenses, mm-hmm. right? Um, that is correct. But yeah, that's a that is a, a tiny tiny person the size of an ant you know with 10 times the the bodily power of its eyes is a really effective way to infect a lot of super people with, mm-hmm. your, with your zombie virus chomp, 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 chomp. yeah the i think the only uh person that was in the episode that was not playing their both um i'm sorry two Spider-Man was actually voiced by Hudson Thames and Josh Keaton voiced Steve Rogers. Captain America. But everyone else was reprising their role from the movies. You know who didn't sound that much like himself? Uh, Was um, Happy. And I'm going to blank on his name. John Favreau. John hey. Favreau's voice work sounds a little different than him in person. Um, who else? Oh my God, I'm like totally blanking on people's names now. Uh, Bruce Banner. Um, Ruffalo. Mark Ruffalo. Jeez. Yeah. Mark, did Mark Ruffalo do his own? Oh yeah. It, like, he sounded weird too in... Um, it, it was Mark Ruffalo, Chadwick Boseman, so. Paul Bettany, Sebastian Stan, Evangeline Lilly, Paul Rudd, John Favreau, Denai Guerrera, Emily Van Camp, David Desmaltian. They yeah, all... they, the the ratio of like returning on screen actors to to do voice work for their for their characters is is pretty high. I think like Tom Holland is like the big outlier on that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I've so far it's been. Um, Tom Holland, uh, Robert Denny Jr., and um, Scarlett Johansson, who mm-hmm. have not voiced their characters. There, and there's been a lot of clickbait, art, clickbait articles that are using that little tiny scrap of data to create clickbait about like, oh, replacement actor for, you know, X character Avenger. Yep. you know spills the beans about i'm like it's real stupid yeah i i made the mistake of clicking on one of those and i'm like this is just talking about how excited the actor the voice actor is to to play this character for the animated show mm-hmm. because, because tom holland wasn't there or, you yes. know, for, for whatever reasons reasons we don't know tom holland was not his own voice actor i suspect it's because he's filming other things for probably. marvel probably uh, I, but I'm like, it, it, and you, you click on one, and now you get all of them. So, Steve is also correct in the the Star Lord episode. That was not Chris Pratt or Dave Bautista. Did Chris? Uh, did Did Star Lord have line? Well, did Peter Quill have lines in that episode? Not so much. I don't think so. Um, but uh, Drax certainly did. And yes. that was not Dave Batista. Definitely not. Yeah. I I thought for a moment that it was a different character of the same race. Mm. But then as soon as he's talking about his wife and daughter, I'm like, no, that's supposed to be Drax. I'm just very, sounding very, very different. Um though I wondered if the Howard the Duck voice might be in a clue to the oh, the uh Seth Green. Yeah, it was Seth Green. Seth Green played Howard the Duck both in Guardians of the Galaxy and in What If. There is going to be a Howard the Duck movie, isn't there? I I don't know about that. Mm, I don't know. That seems possible. (laughs) Really throwing you for a loop here. Um... However, very unlikely. Uh, if there is, there is nothing on um, IMDb other than the original Howard the Duck from 1986. You probably just made it up. Although Steve says that that is the rumor. Mm, it's an interesting <laughs> rumor. I could see Seth Green playing, like starring as Howard the Duck, but that is like a 
that is a weird thing for me to say because I know extremely little about Howard the Duck. Like I couldn't even put it into like words. I just have like this like fuzzy contextual knowledge of like what it means to be Howard the Duck. He's he's a duck <laughs> from another planet that works as a gumshoe on Earth. Right, right. And like, I have like a vague idea of like what that personality is, you know, this duck from another planet who works as a gumshoe on our planet. He's, he's mostly a coward. Okay. Uh, wasn't getting that. See, I told you it was super vague. Oh yeah. No, he's, he's not a heroic character. (laughs) Um, Yes. All right. Well, I'm st- I'm gonna well with that extra information, I'm sticking to my guns. I think Seth Green could definitely play Howard the Duck. I think if they did a Howard the Duck that is based on the more recent series that were was done by Chip Zdarsky and Joe Canones, that it would be great. Also, I'd like to see them paid more than five grand for their efforts. Mm. That's a that's a thing that. Uh, I'd like to see Marvel do more as, you know, the comics, the folks in the comic industry have been weathering this pandemic as best they can. It wouldn't hurt Marvel to share that money with people that bring these characters to life on pages, which is what gets the base of the fan base into theaters in the first place. You mean that money that they've got hand over fist? What? Yes. They've only got... You know, they've got two hands. There's only so much money, you know. No, there's not. There's a there's, lot of no, money. No, there's not. There's... Well, anyway. But I, I'm interested to see what, what if is going to bring us this week. Um, Would you like to know what the name of that episode is? Sure. Uh, so it's going, and it comes out tomorrow, right? Yes. Um mm-hmm. What if Killmonger rescued Tony Stark? Oh, that's going to be an interesting episode. I'm going to. Oh no, it doesn't have it. I'm like, I'm going to actively not look at the synopsis here, but it's not actually there. That's just moving on into other details about the show. Um, um I liked Killmonger as a character. Um, I think Michael B. Jordan's. Uh, take on the character and performance was flat out one of the one of the best in the Marvel Universe so far. Um, yeah, he he, oof, he did great. He really it was did. a it was one of those like wonderfully complex villains in terms of like backstory and motivations and Maybe not quite as complex on like, you know, like where all of his logic took him exactly, but, but still like very real and relatable, I think. Yeah, I, to the degree that I have a hard time referring to him as a villain. Right, but. uh, Much the same way. Yes, he's an antagonist. I don't think he's a villain. Um, Has he done horrible things? Yes. Was he also trained and ordered to do horrible things? Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he's a, he is a product of, you know, the modern American war machine. Mm-hmm. And when he started to fight against that is when they're like, oh, he's a bad guy. Mm, is he? Or is he just using what you taught him against you? Right. The same thing that we argued about with um, the new Captain Marvel. You know, he's he's still a regular ass human dude, and he's also a veteran, which messes you up in uh, no small number of ways. Um, and then and then he, he went and you know, I, I got, think you're mixing up your captains. I did say Captain Marvel, didn't I? You I did. meant Captain America, the okay. new Captain America. Sorry. You meant John Walker. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yep. Um, you know, like well-meaning guy who who probably you know in his eyes has done a lot of good things for his country, et cetera, in the line of duty. Mm-hmm. But 
but it also has had experiences that are irreparably, irreparably damaging to one's psyche. And then you make him super famous, like to try to step into the shoes of someone who is basically an infallible hero at this point. Um, and then he goes and gets superpowers. Mm -hmm. That he's not supposed to have. That he's not supposed to have. Yep. Um, but yeah, like he's not a bad guy. He's not a villain either. It's, a, it's a kind of same, same, same wheelhouse of like antagonist, but not a villain. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's uh, Killmonger's actions once he's in Wakanda and takes the throne is what turns him into a villain. Where it's like, okay, I get it. You're angry, but your anger is now turned into I'm going to do unto my entire, the entire nation what was done to me. It's like, okay. This isn't the nation that did that to you. As far as he's concerned, it is. But yes, you're, you're correct. It's, uh, that's not the, yeah. There are other ways that all of that could have gone. Um, but yeah. Sack is now like... Sack concurs essentially. The, the 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 villainous element of his character really only comes into play once he's set himself up in control of Wakanda. I I have to say that I I think the chat has been everyone who's listening live right now is doing a much better job of commentary than i i feel that i am so it, it's well we weren't great. exactly planning on talking about this topic today so yeah That's right this is true um i think i want to move to lower decks so that we can also try and squeeze in what we do oh yes okay um Lower Decks last week was uh, a true prong episode where we not only focused on what the the team of Mariner and Boimler, who are back together again, um, are doing, but also what uh, Captain Freeman is doing. And as, as an aside, I had this thought today. Um, there's so many things that are going on in Lower Decks and we're all laughing about so much of it, but have any of us actually stopped to go, wait, this is the first show with a Starfleet ship that the captain of the ship is a woman and black. I don't think anyone's talking about that. Well, let me, let me rephrase that. I mm. haven't seen anyone talking about that. Granted, the, the bridge crew is not the focus of the show, but it's still pretty damned it, like it, they're starting to become more of the focus because part of what makes the lower decks so enjoyable is getting to see how that plays off against the bridge crew. Mm. Uh, as uh, I, th I feel staff. like I've mentioned this before, but you know, in, in classic television fashion, there is an A plot and a B plot. Sometimes there's a C plot and that's mm -hmm. usually gets the least amount of airtime and it has like the least impact on the the canon and the, the um, continuity of a show. A plot tends to be the, the one that's yep. most important and B plot is like just some other random shit that's happening in the background. And this is one of those episodes where um, objectively, or I guess if you wanted to look at it traditionally, uh, the situation with the duplers and the bridge crew is what would normally be the A plot. And then the fact that Merritt uh, and- um, Mariner. Mariner, I mashed, I mashed the first name and last name together. Uh, Beckett and Boimler are uh, trying to get into a party mm -hmm. and, and having some shenanery. That is traditionally, the B plot and it's just some it's just some shenanery that's happening in the background but very very certainly to in my mind the the Beckett and Boimler uh, plot line is it's obviously the most important thing because it's the moment where they finally 
have it out about you know like just like this this sense of like betrayal and abandonment that's already like a really tough thing for uh for beckett in fact the the tendy episode uh kind of touches on that a little bit already Mm -hmm. but this is how many see how many episodes into the season are we we're halfway through the season Uh, what is it that was episode five episode six i think that was episode six okay and boimler comes back to the cerritos in the first episode of the season at the tail end of it but but yes and so he's been back for this many episodes and we're just now getting to the point where these two best friends are talking about what happened mm-hmm. and like the the impact that it had on their friendship and and mariner's already like tenuous a relationship with with trust and making friends and re- relying on the people around her mm-hmm. um and so so yeah I, I i know that this is not the first time that i've that this has happened on lower decks or probably pro- certainly not the first time i've commented on that sort of a plot b plot swap but that was to me the most important element of the episode um i think one of the things that uh I saw other Trekkies talking about is that the episode also points out that not only is there a hierarchy within ships, like you have your bridge crew, you have your, your alpha, beta, um, gamma and delta shifts. um, And you have your lower decks, but that exists with, within the hierarchy of ships as well, where it's, you have ships like the Titan, the Enterprise, um, the Defiant. These are frontline ships. They are the, they're the ones that get the shiny missions. They're the ones that go to war. They're the ones that make first contact. Um, and then there's an entire tier of ships that are like the Cerritos who just do administrative work. Mm-hmm. And that is a fascinating tidbit to learn. It's like, oh, oh, right. There would be a bunch of, it's like, yeah, you've made captain, but you're the captain of an administrative ship. <laughs> and if that was not what you joined Starfleet for, I can see where that would start to get a little old. <laughs> yeah, it's not everyone can have adventure all the time. It's just not, that's just not the way it works mathematically. Yeah. And so like it, it was neat to, to see that that's, it's not just the, uh, just the lower deck on any ship that get left out of the loop. It is, there are entire sections of Starfleet that are left out of another loop because they're not, they're not the A team. They're not the B team. They're kind of the D team. <laughs> Which, you know, they did a very good job of like being up front about in the first season. They're like, yeah, we're we're the second contact guys. Mm-hmm. We don't do that. We do this other thing. It's like, oh, that's actually very important. <laughs> that's an incredibly important job. Um, but very boring. <laughs> <laughs> Unless, of course, you are uh, transporting the Dupler emissary, <laughs> and you accidentally let him get his feelings run away. Let him let him let his feelings run away with him. That was Wait. some wonderful uh, guest. That was a guest appearance by Richard Kind, who was perfect for mm-hmm. this fucking character. I could mm-hmm. not have chosen better. Um, <laughs> just this like anxious little you know I, I i can't even put words to like how to describe that character but richard kind was 100 percent that guy mm-hmm. i guess the c plot of the episode ended up being uh, rutherford having kind of a crisis of identity yes um with in dealing with um 
what he lost before the memory wipe and what he's uh, gotten it back. Um, and it's kind of like, it, I think that's going to continue to play out in some very interesting ways. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's one that they've been sort of like, not spoon feeding, but uh, doling out a little bit at a time mm -hmm. uh, over the course of the season, because uh, a couple episodes back, it was Tendi freaking out about things that he likes now that he used to hate. Like now uh, he eats pears. Yeah. And, uh, and that included like having an interest in a gal that he had been on a date with before and it had, he, they hadn't really hit it off. And now they're, now they're, they've gone on multiple dates and it seems like he really likes her and Tendi's feeling anxious about losing her friend. Um, I just want to go swimming with girls. <laughs> um, yeah. And now this, where he is the one grappling with his own changes. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, I agree, and I'm looking forward to seeing like how how that plot line is going to flesh out or or you know wind wind through. Mm -hmm. And once again, that was the C plot, you know, objectively more important to to the characters and the the long game of this show than than the Dupler emissary. But the Dupler emissary was still funny and still needed a resolution. Yes. And uh, by stumbling across the resolution, just by going, oh, you just knock it off. You're the most annoying person ever. And <laughs> having them go. Vroom. And that, that by itself could be like a, a little bit of a, a lesson within the, and like, not that this is a kid's show, but you know, a lot of animated shows, like every episode has like this, like the special lesson that it wants to teach you, like the takeaway. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know, I thought it, I thought it was worth noticing, like, you know what, sometimes the answer is not to like, walk on eggshells for other people or like, like, you know, like cradle their feelings in, in cloud paper, mm -hmm. but, but, you know, like sometimes just be like, Hey, this is this, this that you're doing is not okay. Please, please stop. And then to still be told that What's funny is that is then paired with the message of, hey, you did everything that you were told to do and were supposed to do. You still don't get to be part of this party. <laughs> we, we're still not letting you in behind this velvet rope. Right. I did not expect that um, once they finally got there. I did like that they all went to the same dive bar, though. I think that was a that was a nice little like bow on the top of that one it's just like uh oh but again like calling back to earlier in this season uh you know beckett and the captain her mom uh started out the season being like too close and mm -hmm. spending too much time together you know professionally and personally um and like until they finally were able to admit like we don't even like each other that much let's stop trying to force this mm -hmm. but they can still have a good time together under the right circumstances. Mm -hmm. Like being excluded from a party that they all feel like they deserve to be at. Yep. Um, I did like the, like, I did, I've got to rewatch the episode because I didn't notice until towards the end that there were little um, knickknacks everywhere. And I'm like, oh God, like the, um, the Phoenix, the first warp ship from Earth, was sitting on the bar. Hanging above that was the Doomsday Machine. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, there, there were little uh, tchotchkes all around the bar that's like, wait a minute, that's a... <laughs> huh. I'm going to I'm gonna have to go back to that scene because I didn't catch any of that. Mm -hmm. I need Did to get better about like exclusively paying attention to my television if that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Oh my God, we didn't talk about Star Trek Day because it happened after last week's show. Ah, oh, you're right. Did you watch any of Star Trek Day? No, I did not. That was that was um that was the day that I lost my job, and so I was like, I'm not participating in anything right now. And then I just it was the day up. after, but yeah, Star Trek Day was last Wednesday. Te technically, it was a two day process for me. Oh, great! I got I'm like sorry. A 
I got like a pre-warning and then an official discussion. Oh, fun. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, it is what it is. Um, there's, there's no hard feelings. Um, in, in employment terminology, you were not, you weren't fired. You weren't terminated. You were um, laid off, essentially. Yes, yes. Like, yeah, yeah. To be clear, to be clear, I I've only been fired from a job once, and while I don't care for how it happened, you know, on paper, it was grounds for being fired. No, I was I was laid off, and that's that's why it sucks because like it was brand new. I was I hadn't even done it, been doing it long enough to know if I was truly enjoying it or was it still still the novelty of like learning a new thing because mm -hmm. I, I do like learning new things um yeah it's it was a it was a budget situation and but it was uh it was it was very unexpected so it was i i think hence that why there was like a little bit of advance notice um anyway sure I don't want to like get like too particular about it. Cause that's, not, you know, like after a point it gets to be not my business to tell. Right. So the, um, everything from Star Trek day should be up on uh, Paramount plus or on their YouTube channel. Um, I think I tuned in like two hours after it started. Mm -hmm. So I tuned in in the middle of the discovery panel where, um, Wilson Cruz, uh, Blue Del Barrio, and Ian Alexander were on stage along with um, the executive producer of the show, whose name I've, it's Patty something. I've, I've lost it. Anyway, um, they were talking about what's coming up for this season of uh, Discovery, and we learned things like as far as those three actors are concerned in their characters along with the character of paul stamets there's going to be a lot more family dynamic going on with that with stamets and um q taking more of a mentorship and parenting role around um adira and gray and their focus is going to be on getting gray a corporeal form that, that um, was uh, one of the like, not cliffhangers, but sort of a, a hanging thread at the end of the previous season. So I'm excited to see that that's, that is going to be pursued actively. Mm -hmm. I'm also just, just real quick, super excited about how that cluster of actors is basically like a real family now. Mm -hmm. You know, like I see Wilson Cruz is posting photos about like, just, you know, just on the red carpet with my kids, my family. And I just, I, I'm really here for that. Yeah. Uh, like Ian Alexander and uh, Blue Del Barrio talked about the fact that one of the things that's new that they knew day one, they're like, oh, we're going to be friends. It doesn't matter how this works out. We are going to be friends is the fact that they said they showed up in the same outfit on like day one did do you recall or did they describe what the outfit was they're like combat boots uh black pants hoodie pulled all the way up <laughs> it's like oh it's like you know the gay incognito uniform <laughs> <laughs> i should say that's a that's a solid outfit like, who, who doesn't love that yep um I do believe that um, Hugh, um, uh, Wilson Cruz's character, Hugh, is being promoted from uh, medical officer to ship's counselor. Yes, I did hear about this. So that's going to be fascinating uh, because that's not, in their original timeline, that's not a ship, fun or that's not a... Uh, a staff function that was on most Starfleet ships. Like, but clearly, you know, from TNG forward, they started having ship counselors. Um, hell, even Lower Decks carries on that tradition. Who's the ship's counselor in Lower Decks? It's the guy with the, with the parrot head. It's a, it's a bird-headed man. 
We must not see him very often because I can't even picture it. He's been in like three episodes. Okay. He also dresses like he's a college English lit professor with a, you know the tweed jackets with the elbow patches on the arms. And he actually sits on, the, like, he takes the same seat that Deanna Troy did on the Enterprise and does the same thing that she did. To the left he, of the captain? Yeah. What? He's not on the bridge all the time, but, like, this season he's been on the bridge and, like, sat down next to the captain. I'm like, that's the ship's counselor seat. Okay, got it. <laughs> Which is weird, by the way, that the ship's counselor, I mean, I guess I don't. I don't know enough Star Trek to like give you a full job description explanation of what the ship's counselor is, but immediately to the left of the captain seems like a weird place for the counselor. It it's not if you are an advisor to the captain, if that is one of the functions of your of your uh of your position which is what we were always told about deanna troy no, like, that's, when she, that's like it was he had his executive first officer to the right and his uh, the ship's counselor who was his advisor to his left like those are the two people that he talked to and made decisions on the spot about what to do about things no you're right but also anyone can go to the ship's counselor for Mm -hmm. personal reasons because she's also considered part of like she's part of the medical team i guess i I think maybe that's the part that's weird is like the person who advises the captain is also the person that you know anyone on the ship can come to when they have a personal need a personal thing to discuss Mm -hmm. i don't know why i think that's weird i just think it's weird uh, as steve also points out um she was also half betazoid in their empaths, so or their right. tele- full betazoids or telepaths. She was an empath, um, which, which is useful for a captain to have access to, mm-hmm. for sure. This is true, um, but uh, the thing that most people got excited about was they showed the second season trailer for Picard, mm-hmm. which involves Q and time travel shenanigans and rewriting of history um so season two should be fantastic should be interesting like i'm i'm looking forward to it the thing that really got the internet talking though was the cast and character announcements for star trek strange new worlds yay and son of a bitch So we all knew that it was going to be Pike, Spock, and number one, who we all knew from the original series, and they were recast and reprised, you know, Anson Mount and Rebecca Romaine and and, uh, Ethan Peck are all reprising those roles. What they revealed on Star Trek Day is those are not the only legacy characters in this show. And the other legacy characters are Cadet Nayota Uhura mm-hmm. making the first name of Nayota now canon. Um, it wasn't before. When was it ever used? It was used in the Kelvin timeline. Okay. Um, Nurse Christine Chapel and uh, uh, Dr. Mabenga who like has, I think, appeared in three episodes of Star Trek and was the chief medical officer when Dr. McCoy wasn't there. Okay, so that would be why I'm not familiar mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. I don't think you've ever seen an episode with him in it. I don't think so either. Um, so that's amazing. It's like, it, it, as I think Rebecca Romaine pointed out, she's like, you couldn't have had number one and christine chapel on the same show in the old days because you know they were played by the same actor (laughs) (laughs) um well and also you can't have too many lead women back in the day so Mm -hmm. or not not even lead but you know the the other three actors um one of them is playing um 
and Anar, uh, who we've only seen in Enterprise before. So they're the um, albino blind Andorians. Yes. Um, and they're actually being, uh, they they cast uh, a, a blind person to play that role, correct? The, I don't know. I thought I remember hearing that that was the case. Um, it would help if I knew what that character's name was or the actor for that matter. That's what IMDb is for. Um, the Well, no, they, I'm, I'm on IMDb, but I don't know what the, what the character's name is. Uh, it begins with an H. Uh, Hammer? Yeah. Right, so let's click here. So that character is being played by Bruce Horak. Mm-mm-mm. Would help if I could see my whole screen. Bio. Sorry, guys. We're doing this. I'm doing this, apparently. Clearly. Doesn't it doesn't say there's not really a biography. Interesting. It's because he's not known for much. <laughs> okay, that's fine. We can we can move past that. Uh, yeah, I don't know that I if this is true, this is the first I've heard it because I haven't heard anything. Um then um, we we have well, uh Melissa. Navia playing Erica Ortegas. And apparently one other role. Um, and as far as I can tell, she looks like she's probably uh, at the helm. And then we have a character named Laan Nunian Singh. Yeah, what's, with, what's up with that? No one knows. It, so, it like n- it threw everybody. Nunians, it's Khan Nunian Singh, correct? Yeah, that is correct. So, like in theory, this is some sort of predecessor. No, she wouldn't be a predecessor. She'd be a. <laughs> she would be right. A descendant. That's the part that always throws me off. Is like in the timeline, Strange New World is happening before the events of. Uh, what is that? Star Trek two, four. Seven? Star Trek two and Space Seed. However, Khan is from nineteen ninety three. Yeah, that's the part I always forget. That, right. That there's a big old jump for him. Um. Okay, but they have so they haven't really they didn't really reveal much about that character besides no, all they this did is the was, actor and this is the character. Yeah, that's all they did was like, hi, I'm so and so, and I'm playing this character, and people went. I'm what? What? It's like I know that name. I don't know that name, but I know that name. And they've actually finally given number one uh, a full name, which is Una Chin Riley. And I think they've hinted that her name was Una before, but this is the first time we've actually heard heard her use that. Mm-hmm. So it should be interesting. Going back to what you were saying earlier, I had totally forgotten that um, the same actress who played number one that one time was then later also um, Nurse Chapel. I had, because right, right, because because number one is only in the pilot. In the original pilot, yes. I I had I I know I know I knew it, but. Um, I had forgotten that they were the same actress. Mm-hmm. Majel Barrett Roddenberry. So it'll be it'll be interesting to see them flesh out that character a little bit more. <clears throat> Nurse Chapel, of course, had more mm-hmm. screen time over over the course of the series, but they can kind of do whatever they want with Rebecca Remain's character now. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh yeah, and and she plays Laxana. I for, I almost forgot about that too. Can you forget Laxana Troy? <laughs> I 
I hated the character of Luxana Troy when I was a kid in watching Star Trek Next Generation the first time around. I could see that. And as an adult, like when I'm a teenager, it's like, oh, she's the most annoying character ever because, you know, she's a mom. <laughs> she's no forbearing mother. Um, as an adult, now I look at it and you're like, I 100% get and am behind the actions of Luxana Troy. <laughs> Because she was a woman who took zero shit from anyone. Ever. Which, she knew who she was. She knew what she wanted to do in the universe. She was honest with herself. She was honest with the people around her. Yeah. And, his, and historically, those are undesirable traits in women. Mm-hmm. Um. Did I ever end up sharing on the show about when I recently went to an improvised Star Trek musical rehearsal performance? No. So this was relatively recently and I was invited by now former work people, but new work people at the time, people I met through Reverend Nance. Um, and they um, are a uh, big fan of something called improvise no not improvise. that's a podcast uss um, improvise uss improvise thank you yeah. um and so it's it's a improv fully improvised musical performance a la star trek next generation and mm -hmm. uh and I, I assume it's probably different every time in terms of like what characters they play as and what um what the general plot or theme of the, the performance is going to be. General plot. But um, but this one was all like romantic relationships centric and heavily featured the character of Luxwana Troy, uh, who was in love with, no, well, she, she had relations with Worf who was then of course wants to marry her, but she's like, no, nah, we're just having a fling. Um, it also involved uh, Deanna Troy falling in love with someone, not Riker. Riker's in love with someone else. And then um, Beverly Crusher is in love with Riker. But that, that was, confusing. Was, <laughs> it was ridiculous. It was absolutely ridiculous. Uh, but again, a heavily featured Luxana Troy. And that's probably the most time I've ever spent with that character. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Oh, look, there's Aaron in the chat. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I waved. He can't see me waving. I mean, he, he can. He's on Facebook watching the live feed. Never mind. <laughs> I still, think, we, I still think about the chat in, in like, you know, the old fun employment radio days, like before anybody live stream their faces uh, and the chat was just just there the, yeah. the only visual component was 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 the text no they they see what we see oh uh oh uh -huh. i'd have been doing this whole thing differently if i'd have realized um yeah uh i think the the release schedule for all of Star Trek. Um, we've got Lower Decks through the, I think through the end of October. Um, October 28th is uh, the premiere of Star Trek Prodigy on Nickelodeon. Are you planning on watching that? Yes. Um, the trailer, they had a full trailer for that. And I'm like, this looks great. It also looks like it's a show for kids. It's 100% not, it feels like it is not marketed specifically to Trekkies, mm -hmm. but that it is trying to come up with a show that's in, visually interesting to a different audience to bring them into the fold of Trek. I'm all gotta, for it. Gotta get them young. I, th I think it's great. Um, Star Trek Discovery Season 4 starts November 18th. Star Trek Picard comes back in 
February, which should probably align with the end of Discovery Season 4, the beginning of the card, which should put a Strange New World sometime in April. I don't think they've set a release date. Mm. But, but logically speaking, that's where they would put it. Mm-hmm. So that, that sounds like Star Trek until next spring. Yeah, we should have Star Trek through like to the beginning of summer. Right. Because there's so, 10 until, episodes until of Strange Until the end of the normal world. season time. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be running concurrently with all new Star Wars stuff. Always new Star Wars stuff. Well, there hasn't been any. Like um, the last new the last new Star Wars stuff was Bad Batch. Right. Well, that that just ended like three weeks ago. How long has it been? I don't know time anymore. August. Middle the mid of August. It's been a month. August. Okay. Yeah. I remember that I missed the the week that we talked about the finale. Because mm-hmm. again, I've been in and out for a month for various reasons. Um, and and then. Um, but uh, the book of Boba Fett should start here soon. October, I think. Uh, so that's, oh, that's wait. Like a... Bex brings up a good point. Star Wars Visions is supposed to start. That's next week. Good God. That's the... Um, Hold up. Visions is the um, animated series that's done by... Um, famous uh anime producers oh right okay i was not hearing as much about that one since we first talked about it um and yet bo- it says book of boba fett is not coming out until december yeah okay that's so, about right i'm guessing vi- and then visions is starting on the 22nd so that's that's another week and some change jesus all right fantastic Yay, it's fall again. And now we've talked about all this stuff and we didn't have time to talk about what we do in the shadows. Damn it. <laughs> Quickie. Um, I think I think we should do more of a tease that we will start talking about this more regularly. Uh, both Aaron and Denise were waiting for me to catch up. And as of, I think, spring, I finally made it through seasons one through were there only two seasons? Were are we on season this three? This is the third season. Why does it feel like so much more? Because they, they already announced. In. Because they announced the uh, the fourth season before the third one even started airing. Okay. Um, I loved the the season two cliffhanger with uh, Guillermo fully embracing uh, his uh, vampire hunter roots and slaying most of the vampire council, um, <laughs> uh, and having the first episode of season three just kind of pick up after that it's been great so uh, so especially moving into spooky season we're going to talk more about what we do in the shadows and uh, if you aren't watching that there will be spoilers so i'm sorry also for the record i'm going to be watching malignant tonight Ooh. because apparently people are a buzz and like you know you got to jump on it before you get spoiled it is, uh, from what I understand, it is you either love it or you hate it. Oh, there, interesting. There are no in-betweens. Okay. You know, I just based on the trailer, I, I feel like I could I could see that being the case. But I'm still going to still gonna check it out. I don't think I've seen the trailer. I've just seen the poster that was in the theater. Mm. Um, I think it's on HBO Max. So again, title card. Look at our new thing that we have for you. Daddy made you oh. some content. Interesting. All right. Well, I need to start watching more horror stuff too. I think I'll start with still need to get around to watching Fear Street because I want to watch those three things. Oh yeah. Oh man, we gotta start planning October now before before we're there. No um, kidding. I feel like I just watched a scary movie too. And now I can't even think of the title. Fail. I'll, I'll yeah, remember it in like 10 minutes. Sure. All right. Well, any last thoughts? Um, no, I think mostly I'm hungry. 
Me too. I'm going to have mac and cheese tonight because I'm an adult. It's a good thing to do. We are going to have uh, broccoli and gnocchi. Gnocchi. Mm. Oh, so new. Gnocchi. Gnocchi. Um, We have a recipe that you fry it in a pan instead of boil it. So it's crispy gnocchi. Oh, yeah. That's the best way to do gnocchi. Yep. Sheet pan. Um, Hold on real quick. What, What is a killer sofa, Zach? A what? Oh, I misread it. Uh, Sex said that he watched Killer Sofa, and then I read a movie produced by a Dubik. I'm like, what? But it's a movie about a chair possessed by a Dubik. That's still kind of strange, and I need a little more, but I am I am intrigued. I don't see that message at all. Uh, it, was, it was not that long ago. Yeah, my live chat sometimes does not um, operate the way it's supposed to. Like, I'll go back and, and look at things and discover that um, a whole bunch of stuff got missed. They have, like, multiple settings. We could get into it, but I don't want to do that live. But we can yeah. talk about it if you want. Let's see, we can compare. Um, okay, well, with that... Um, uh, Next week, we have a guest. Is that next week? Yes, it is. Yes, next week, we will have Reverend Nat. Reverend Nat uh, will be on to talk about, if Aaron were here, he would know. I can't remember what it is. Probably uh, something to Pache related. And then eventually, Lord of the Rings. Almost well, certainly about Lord of the Rings. Um, the worst why am i producing right now <laughs> because i don't know how so you're you're not the worst i am oh. um i would say and i'm also trying to finalize a, a guest for the week after that do you want to tease it no because i Twist haven't it? sent anything Bop it. it it'll be horror related there that's a Perfect. tease that's enough that is that is a fair plenty all righty all right with that i have been your host bean rita and i am still cable hashtani <laughs> and we will talk to you all next week i do what i want